Hello, my name is Ben Friedman here from the Beniverse. For those who do not know me, I am a contributing writer for Highbrow Magazine. I am a content creator here on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. I'm on all the social medias at the Beniverse. And what I've been doing these past few weeks is I've been talking about my power rankings for the Academy Awards this year, the 95th Academy Awards. This has been a very weird year. There's been a lot of movies that have fallen off. There's just been a lot of question marks surrounding these movies. There's been films that have fallen off just completely where it was believed they were going to be big contenders. There's films that just emerged out of nowhere. There's films that are surging. There's films that are falling. And we are going to see what happens with them. So today I am here to talk about Best Actor and Best Actress. I'll be actually cutting those two videos apart. So I'll have a Best Actor video, a Best Actress video. So we're going to get into it all. But before I start anywhere, I just wanted to address a few things before we get on. First, if this is your first time watching this channel, please remember if you like this video to like and subscribe to my channel. It helps a lot. And if you want to follow me anywhere else, I am beniverse.media on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all of that good stuff. You can follow that or you can check the comments or I mean description in my link below. Moving forward from that housekeeping, let's just talk about the overview of this episode today. I am going to be focusing on Best Actor and Best Actress, but I also should mention the BAFTA nominations came out today, which I am recording this today, Thursday, I believe this is the 19th, Thursday the 19th. The BAFTA nominations, for anyone who does not know, is BAFTA is the British, what is it, British American, no, BAFTA, I don't, it's British something film television art, something along those lines. It's basically the British Oscars. And for anyone uh, who does not know how this differs besides the fact that it's British, and you'll see that reflective in the votes, there's some very big things that I wanted to point out when I'm talking about power rankings and why I don't particularly take the BAFTAs very seriously. Now, again, all this is speculative. All this, I am not speaking from any real knowledge. Anybody who says they can predict exactly what the Academy is going to do is completely for a horse something. They can't. You cannot predict what the Academy is going to do. And one of the reasons is it's because it's a very different body that votes in the BAFTAs versus the Academy Awards. Now, not to say that there is not some crossover. Some people who vote for the BAFTAs do vote in the Academy Awards. Or like I talked about last week, some people who bill, who vote in the Guild Awards vote in the Academy Awards. But it's a much wider net that's casted out. The Academy is much more refined in their selection of members. BAFTA, you know, I was looking up the rules on how to become a BAFTA member as long as you work anywhere in the entertainment industry and are willing to pay the 450 pounds a year in fees, I guess you qualify as a BAFTA member. There's a lot of BAFTA members out there. I believe the number was over 10,000 <coughs> plus. That's not how the Academy works. The Academy's invitation. You have to, you have to be in Hollywood. You have to be proven basically to get in. And that's why there was this whole Oscar so white, the expansion of the academies. That's why the awards have become even harder to predict because there's a much younger demographic where before it was very much Hollywood legends or older people voting. But anyway, that is to say that unrefined groups like BAFTAs and Guild Awards, you know, I was listening to FYC, which is another uh, Oscar prognation. God, Lord, sometimes I suck at talking. It is another show about Oscar contenders. I'm not even going to try to say the word that I was trying to say. It's hosted by Scott Mance, Perry Nimeroff, Jeff Snyder. It's on Perry Nimeroff's YouTube channel. Check it out. I've had both Mance and Snyder on my channel before. They are both lovely, excellent, standout human beings. Uh, so show them some love. But Jeff, Sm Jeff Snyder made this really good point last week. Uh, on the show where he was talking about the SAG nomination and the Guild Awards. For SAG in particular, you can be a member of SAG by just being a working actor in Hollywood and paying your dues. You know, he made the point that your waiter, if you live in LA, who's an actor, there's a good chance they are SAG voter. And how they do it is this voting council 
that is built up of a certain amount of them. It is not like you have to get the most prestigious actors. I mean, literally people in SAG can, or can get nominated in there. It's a certain amount of numbers. I'm explaining it fairly poorly because, again, I don't know the inner workings of it. But this is all more to the point to illustrate that the voting is unrefined. The Academy is much more refined. And thus, some people who are claiming... Well, Steven Spielberg doesn't have a chance because he did not get a BAFTA directing nomination and the film didn't get Best Picture and Michelle Williams did it. Does that mean Fablemans is dropping like crazy? No, don't take it like that. And I'm going to say why. Uh, before we get into the Best Actor and Actress nominees that BAFTA did this year, I wanted to point out something, and this is why I don't take BAFTA particularly seriously in the awards. Let's look at Best Actor from last year. This is the year Will Smith won for King Richard. So, one, do note, BAFTA gets six nominations. They vote for six people for Best Actor. So, last year, they voted Will Smith for King Richard, Adil Akhtar for Ali and Ava, Mahershala Ali for Swan Song, Benedict Cumberbatch for The Power of the Dog, Stephen Graham for Boiling Point, and Leonardo DiCaprio for Don't Look Up. If I am correct, I know Will Smith wins it. Cumberbatch is nominated. I, I'm almost positive DiCaprio is not nominated. So thus, that means two out of the six nominations BAFTA had crossed over with the Oscars. And remember, they had one extra slot. Best Actress. This is where this is where I think anyone who is saying chances are over. This is dropping like crazy. What does this mean? This is where you should look at the category and just, just calm down for a little bit. Best Actress last year. This is the year, of course, uh, Jessica Chastain wins for Eyes of Tammy Faye. The nominations are Tessa Thompson for Passing. Very good performance. Uh, you have, I, I cannot pronounce this name, so I do apologize. Renate Renesov for Worst Person in the World. I do apologize for that pronunciation. I forgot to break it up earlier today. Amelia Jones for Coda, very underrated performance from last year. Alana Haim for Liquor Speech, though, one of my favorite performances of last year. Lady Gaga for House of Gucci. And the winner was Joanne Senlin for After Love. Uh, just for reference, zero out of the six actresses were nominated for the Academy Award that ended up going to Jessica Chastain. Zero. So anyone who says oh, BAFTA particularly matters in nominating and the narrative and just the race itself. Don't take it seriously. It's just, it's a bunch of, how do I best describe it? It's a, it's film Twitter. <laughs> That's kind of the best way to describe it. It is people who live in a bubble, who believe what they believe, who take too much weight and do not fully understand at all times that what they what they say, what they prognosticate is not always reality. And I'm guilty of doing that myself. I am not blaming any of these people. I think a lot of them are extremely talented writers, gifted prognosticators. It's just like I said, sometimes we overvalue something. Sometimes when we're so in the weeds, it's just easy to forget. And it's easy to take everything so literal and just remember that we don't really know anything. And let me state that. That's the point of the power rankings that I'm about to do. I don't know anything. I just have hunches. I have theories. I have reasons. I have knowledge based on past, but the past you can only take to so much heart. I'm a historian. For those who do not know, I went to college. I was graduated with a history degree. I was one of the top in my class. That's not a brag or anything, but I do understand how to do research. And I also do understand at looking at past trends. And one thing you learn in history is while it is important to understand the past, while it is important to understand historical trends, I accidentally knocked down some Blu-rays there. While it's important to know that, to then directly correlate that to the present is going to be a mistake. You, there has to be more diving in, there has to be more research, there has to be more studies, there has to be more just evidence, and there just is always an element of luck and un non-understanding, growth, non-growth, whatever you want to call it, that changes everything. Let me just state this as a historian that, like I said, it's very important and it's a very easy trend to look at. 
When you're studying the past, it does not always reflect on the future. Good ways to understand that is going into war. These are the reasons that we went into this war, such as Iraq, versus these are the reasons we went into Vietnam. Now, it's not a one-on-one -on -one comparison. However, you can look at it and say, this is either America trying to do this, this is America trying to expand capitalism, this is a further fight against uh, socialism, all these things, this is universal conflict, this is affecting trades, whatever it may be, you can look at those factors and say, these are the factors that typically in history have led to war, these are the conflicts, these are the men, and these are the characteristics of these men and women who lead us into war. But then to say that Vietnam is the exact same as Iraq is just a false equivalency. That's what I'm referring to when I'm talking about this podcast. To, for me to speculate is not for me to draw a false equivalency. I can say based on trends. I can say based on ideas. I can say based on just how it passes a smell test. This is why I believe this is in the best case scenario to win. What I cannot do is say based on this, based on that, based on this information given to me, this is going to just categorically, unquestionably win best actor, best actress. That's impossible to do. No one can do it. And it'd be a fool errands to assume anybody who is saying they can do that is correct. There is always a human element to these. And I am doing my best to interpret these trends, these ideas, and give insight and analysis. I am a commentator and all I am simply doing is adding commentary into this year's best actor and best actress race. With that all said, let's get into the nominations for BAFTA this year, which I think largely are actually gonna pan out fairly in favor of the BAFTAs this year. For best actor, they nominated Austin Butler for Elvis, Colin Farrell for The Banshees of Inishirin, Brendan Fraser for The Whale, Daryl McCornack for Good Luck to You, Leo Grun, Paul Mescal for After Sun, and Bill Nye for Living. For Best Actress, they nominated Kate Blanchett for Tar, Viola Davis for The Woman King, Ana de Armas, yikes, for Blonde, Daniel Deadweiler for Tar, Emma Thompson for Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, and Michelle Yeoh for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I actually typically think you're going to see a lot of crossover in the list that I'm about to present for my power rankings. There are some weird ones in there. I will just straight up say right now, good luck to you, Leo Grand, Grande, whatever you want to call it. It's not getting in the race. Uh, this is a British award festival. The, Emma Thompson is British. That's the reason she's in there. She's not getting into the Oscars, and I'll just I'll spoil that right now. She's not on going to be on anywhere near my top even eight. Uh, obviously, that's then the same with Daryl McCornack, who has an even lesser chance of getting nominated for Best Actor than uh, Emma Thompson does. The Ana de Armas one is interesting. We'll get into it uh, later. And then for Best Film, the BAFTA is nominated All Quiet on the Western Front, Banshees of Inishering, Elvis, Everything Everywhere, All at Once, Tar. For those in Banshees, Elvis, Everything Everywhere, and Tar seem to be contenders legitimately for Best Picture. It's the All Quiet on the Western Front. I, It's kind of unknown. I am so at a loss for where this movie is going to be on Best Picture. I will just say right now, I will be, before the awards drop, the award nominations drop Tuesday, I will be giving my prediction for what is going to win or get nominated, I should say, for Best Picture. So I'll have that on this channel. So again, if you want to see that video, make sure to subscribe to the Beniverse right now so you'll see that champ, so you'll see that video when it drops. But I'm like I said, I'm a little unsure about All Quiet on the Western Front, and we'll see what it does. But I, I don't think it's unfair to say that film could end up becoming the ninth or tenth film nominated for Best Picture. Do I think it has any chance of winning? No. Could it get nominated? Could the international body really push and rally behind this film? Yeah, I, I don't see that being unlikely. One other thing that I want to mention, I'll get into it a little bit again for the best actor race, is Paul Mescal getting in for After Sun. I have seen this narrative being pushed. After Sun 
is this just great indie? It's this been this great success story? That is completely correct. I am not taking away anything from After Sun. What I am going to, again, warn about the narrative and just warn everybody who is listening to other prognosticators, anything like that. After Sun earned $2.8 million. This isn't a widely seen film. So again, that's the thing. If you and all your Twitter followers or Letterbox followers or everyone on your TikTok feeds are like raving about that, do know you are talking to a very specific audience. Same with Fablemans. Fablemans, despite being the financial non-success that it was at the box office, did earn $20.3 million, which is $18 million more than After Sun. So do just, like I said, keep all of those numbers in mind because it does imply more people have seen the Fablemans than After Sun. Very key. But let's now get into Best Actor. So these are my Best Actor Power Rankings. So let me pull up my list right here. I have 13. I have a few in a category that I call non-starters. These are two people who were in the awards conversation and due to very specific reasons are no longer in those award conversations. So I have a list of 13. These are two names. These are 13 and 12. They are not in the conversation. So I'll just go with 13. Uh, you might have heard about this guy. He uh, he had uh, some notoriety earlier this year uh, when he told Chris Rock to keep his wife's name out his effing mouth. I am, of course, referring to uh, Will Smith. Uh, let's just say Will Smith could have earned a double nomination for Emancipation. The exact second he slapped Chris Rock at the Academy Awards basically ruined any chance of him getting nominated the following year. I mean, the guy's banned from the actual ceremony for 10. He, I, it seemed so unlikely that they were ever going to nominate him. This film had a mixed reception. You know, it's not a particularly charismatic performance. Will Smith is so good at being charismatic, and this film is very ultra serious in its approach. And like I said, just due to the slap of it all, Will Smith's at 13. He's not getting a nomination. There's no chance for emancipation. Where a year ago, people were talking, is Will Smith going to be a double Oscar winner or at least be a contender for two awards? That is all gone. Uh, Number 12, another film that has fallen off for very specific reasons as well. It is uh, a film called The Sun, and the main performer in that is an actor by the name of Hugh Jackman. The Sun has been ridiculed since release. It had a rough go at the film festival that premiered at, which I believe was Telluride. If not Telluride, it might have been Venice, and then I'm pretty sure it played a tiff. It was pretty quickly cast aside as Oscar bait. It was kind of seen as very emotionally manipulative. It was very divisive due to its... The subject matter at hand, which was depressing, suicide, and it was kind of seen as maybe not a mockery of it, but ill-adapt. It was ill-adapt to handle what it was trying to do, and it ended up just feeling very bad. People left the theater feeling miserable, feeling like emotionally tormented, but without any purpose or without anything of meaning to say. Hugh Jackman is the son you know, he went from somebody that people are like, he's probably going to win the award, or if not win the award, be in major contention to, he's not in contention. He's not getting the nominations. The next one is a group of, it looks like four people. So this would be my 11, 10, 9, and 8. These are people that have a chance. I'm calling them contenders. I wouldn't call them the most likely contenders, but they are simply the people that are in contention, in contention. So with that said, let's go for my number 11. This man is named Diego Calva. He made his name this year in the film Babylon, a performance that I thought was good. Uh, I thought the character was a little underwritten, and the film certainly had its issues, but I thought Calva was good in it. The mixed reception, the box office failure, no financial success, the fact that Margot Robbie may not be getting in for Best Actress, in fact, at this moment, probably is not going to get in. It just doesn't bode well for Calva. They're going to, the studios know what is going to get them nominations and they know what they should push for. And they honestly have a better chance getting uh, Babylon in there for Robbie 
and for uh, music score. So I just don't see them putting the strong campaign with Calva. So I just think just due to the mixed reception, due to how divisive Babylon has been, it's not going to get a numbered uh, nomination. Coming in at number 10 is a film that maybe has a little bit of a better shot than people are predicting, but I still just, it's not going to get the nomination. It's Tom Hanks and a man called Otto. I saw this film this week and it's very inoffensive. It's very sweet. It's very earnest, but the earnestness works enough for the film. I wouldn't call this a particularly great film, but I found myself emotionally invested in it, largely due to Tom Hanks, who I think gives a really good performance. He is a Hollywood legend. It is a safe nomination to give it to Tom Hanks. Uh, The reception has been more positive than I think anyone was particularly anticipating, And based on just how bad that trailer, I think most people were kind of expecting this to just kind of be a flop. And it's been a solid box office hit so far. Again, I just, I don't think it was enough or a big enough draw. And it came in really late that I just don't see it making waves at the Academy Awards or really even getting a nomination. But it's Tom Hanks, you can't rule it out. So I think it's fair to say he is in somewhat of contention. Coming in at number nine, though, is a guy who I wish was in more contention. And... I think it's simply the case of this film in the studio is putting their energy in other categories that they either are more vulnerable in or they think they actually have a chance at winning. And that is for the film The Fablemans, and that performance is Gabriel LaBelle, who I thought was excellent in The Fablemans. Like I said, it's simply the case of Universal truly believes Spielberg could win Best Director. Director, They believe the film could win Best Picture. They think Michelle Williams has a chance to be nominated. You know, they have a screenplay nomination. They have a lot of below-the-line categories. John Williams' score. Like, they have enough that they have in play that Gabriel LaBelle is just going to kind of fall through the wayside. So I just don't predict this being a nomination that he receives. Uh, I would like for me to be surprised on this. I would be more than thrilled if he was in the top five. I just don't see it anywhere possible. Coming in at number eight is a performance that I'm actually maybe am underrating. Maybe it should be slightly higher. You'll have to let me know. I'm saying Jeremy Pope for the inspection comes in at number eight. Now, this was a very small A24 release. I totally understand that. It is a indie release through and through. He is the reason you see the movie. He is sensational in a movie that is very standard. It is a very important subject. It is a very, for lack of a better word, messagey film. It is a film about being gay. It is a film about being black in the military, experiencing that. And it's a very raw film. It's very emotionally charged. And while I found the simplicity of the story maybe not to always work in the favor of the inspection, Jeremy Pope is sensational in the film. So I think there may be some logic for him getting it in. And... If you wanted to take a cynical approach at the Oscars, which might be fair, at this moment there is not particularly any person of color nomination in works for Best Actor. This would be the argument that if someone was deserving, he seems the most deserving, he's garnered the most praise, this seems like a nomination that they would be able to push. Again, I don't necessarily like making that argument, but there is certainly an element of self-awareness and basically self-image that the Oscars has been very concerned with recently. So to say that is not to say that his nomination would simply be a token nomination. I don't want to take that away from him and his performance. It is simply saying the Academy is aware of their history the backlash it has received, and they would like to reward a film like this. This is this would be evidence, basically, against all the, the contraire. Again, I don't think it's going to be, and I think this year is we're going to actually see a lot of controversy because there is a lot of deserving people of color who are just being completely shut out. There's a lot of women who are being completely shut out of this race for a very multitude of reasons. We'll see how it all works out and what happens with it. 
but yeah, that's why I have Jeremy Pope at eight. Like I said, maybe he should be six. Let me know if I'm wrong. Number seven, uh, actor who he got a SAG nomination. It was pretty surprising that he got the SAG nomination, especially because he missed out a few years ago. It's Adam Sandler for Hustle. You know, I loved him in Uncut Gems. I think he's such an underrated actor. I thought he was great in Hustle. Uh, it has proven to be a success. I mean, he's been at all, he's been campaigning, he's been doing all the things, he's been at the round tables, people love him. Is this the year the Oscars finally embrace Adam Sandler? I, I, I'm dubious of it. But, I mean, there is certainly some evidence to suggest that, you know, this is a well-liked actor. People in Hollywood have been working with him for years. It'd be a fun nomination to get. I just don't see it being realistic. But, I mean, the SAG nomination, you have to bump him up a little bit for that. I mean, he went from somebody that I really didn't see standing any chance to at least now being in the conversation. Going from that, though, I have... So, Sandler, like I said, he's the next in line. He's like that six and seven spot so coming in at six is the guy that he could be the top five maybe he should be bumped in there i'm just not willing to put it there and it's for a film that got him a uh bafta nomination i mentioned him earlier it's paul mescal for uh after sun hollywood and the academy likes to do this thing where they anoint the next big star uh, they do, they've done it before with Rami Malek. They've done it with other actors where it's just like, uh, what's his name? Eddie Redmayne is a great example of that, where they're just like, you're going to be a star in the next few years. Let's reward you early on in your career. So Paul Mescal's just got announced as the uh, new Gladiator in Gladiator 2, Ridley Scott's Gladiator 2. He's going to be a name in Hollywood for the next few years. Could this lead to a nomination? It could. Uh, and then the, I think the biggest question is, does After Sun get a Best Picture nomination? If it does, maybe that helps Paul Mescal's chances. At this moment, I'm not predicting it, so that's why he's in the outside looking in. But don't count him out. So that's why he's at my number six. Coming in at number five is a name I'm still pretty certain on. I know a lot of people have soured on this. I know a lot of people just aren't predicting this name to get in. I still have a feeling about this i mean how do you ignore the box office sensation that was completely centralized around this one man this movie and he's a guy larger than life he's a, he's a true hollywood star and icon and he will be nominated for a best picture uh award this year for top gun maverick and that's tom cruise this is the ultimate movie star performance giving the ultimate movie star film and I, it's hard to imagine them not nominating Tom Cruise. He has had success with the Academy. Now he's never won, but he's definitely had success. He's been nominated, I believe, four times. It just seems like, you know, this is the films that Hollywood seems like they want to make sure is getting focused on. This was a film that earned $1.6 billion and was a financial and critical success. I feel like they want to reward this film. And Cruz being the face of all this, being the charisma that he is, giving a legitimately great performance, which I already said on one of my podcasts, it's my favorite performance uh, from a leading actor this year. I, I'm still predicting him in my five. I think he's more safe than someone like Mescal for a film that really not a ton of people have seen. Speaking of a film not a ton of people have seen, I'm putting Bill Nye in there for living. Here's my issue with putting living this high. Who has seen living i go out of my way to make sure i see these contenders there's been no screenings available for me i haven't been able to see living and i've been working on trying to see living now i know academy voters have much more access to awards but it just means sorry i know the academy has much more access to screeners I know if they want to see Living, they're probably at a much more likely place to do it because, you know, if they live in L.A., there's screeners going on all the time. With that all said, though, there's no conversation about this. Like, this hasn't reached anywhere besides people who got to see it at the festivals. It's just no one's gone to see this film, so there's no real discussion about it except that, oh, Bill Nye is going to probably be nominated for this. Just no one's seen it. It just seems so hard to predict a film 
for best actor that ultimately no one's going to see. But I mean, Willem Dafoe did it a few years ago for At Eternity's Gate, so it's not impossible. And Bill Nye is a living legend. I just, like I said, it's hard for me to prognosticate him so high. But based on all consensus, based on every award, he's getting the nomination, and I just don't have a good argument against it. So he's at my number four. Coming in at number three is, I think these three are the solid, these are the three contenders, these are going to be one of your three winners. And I put this person at number three just because it's a weird movie that I just don't know fully if the Academy will embrace, although they have embraced this director before, specifically this director directing performances in Francis McDormand and Sam Rockwell. This guy's never been nominated for an Academy Award, so that's a very good narrative. This could be a time to reward him. It's probably his best performance to date, and that's Colin Farrell for The Banshees of Inisherin. It's just a weird film. It's a very dark comedy. He's very good in it. It just seems like these other two names above him have more going for it. So that's why Farrell's at number three. Coming in at number two is Austin Butler. Elvis was huge. Elvis was absolutely huge this year. This was a film that made a lot of money and was far more of a critical success than Bohemian Rhapsody, which won Rami Malek, the best actor, statue. I just think there is an element of uniqueness in this performance. I, and again, this idea that I've talked about anointing the next star in Hollywood this is a guy who's gotten a lot of offers. This is a guy who's going to appear in Dune 2 later this year. This is a guy who's making his name in Hollywood. He's well-liked. I mean, if you saw that Golden Globe speech, he is oozing charisma. He's friends with apparently everyone. You know, Brad Pitt's smiling and just excited that he's there. Tarantino's thrilled. These are voters. These are his peers. They're going to vote. Could easily garner him the nomination for this. I am not. I would not be shocked if he wins. It's just ultimately the number one person on this list who's been the number one for a while and I just don't see drop in despite how divisive the film has proven, a film that I did not like, mind you, it's still Brendan Fraser. The narrative of Brendan Fraser is so strong. I mean, he was somebody who wasn't working really in Hollywood. He was somebody that was sexually assaulted by a by the HPFA, which is the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. This guy has come through and overcome a lot of adversity in his life and gives a truly touching performance in The Whale. I did not like the film. He's pretty exceptional in it. He has some really magical scenes in there where you really just feel the power of an actor, and he really brings the script to life as best as he can based on the material he has to work with. It's just so much. This narrative is powerful. The performance is powerful. It's the type of performance that typically wins actors' best actor i mean he's in a ton of prosthetics it looks like not an easy gig to work it's like i said it just it feels like the perfect accumulation of everything and that's why brendan fraser is still my number one with that all said that's my best actor predictions so those are my power rankings i'll run them again real quick will smith four emancipation at 13 12 is hugh jackman the son 11 is diego Catalava for Babylon. 10 is Tom Hanks for A Man Called Otto. 9 is Gabriel LaBelle for The Fablemans. Number 8 is Jeremy Pope for The Inspection. Number 7 is Adam Sandler for Hustle. Number 6 is Paul Mescal for After Sun. Number 5 is Tom Cruise for Top Gun Maverick. Number 4 is Bill Nye for Living. Number 3 is Colin Farrell for The Banshees of Inishiri. Number 2 is Austin Butler for Elvis. And coming in at number 1 is Brendan Fraser for The Whale. So those are my predictions for Best Actor. 